is the orientation of the sensor in some other reference frame. And the body is another reference frame. It's not the same one as the yeah. sensor. So that's uh, all of these are valid in terms of terminology. OK, so, but if we're talking about the angle of the eye relative to the eye, that would be a rotation, not an orientation. Angle of the eye relative to the Like if I'm moving my eye around. That's, that's, that's a movement. Uh, well, I'm changing the angle that my eye is pointed towards. What does that mean? Like it's a, a change in orientation of the sensor. Uh, yeah, so, that's a change in orientation. Which, yes, yeah, a change yes, in orientation yeah. of the sensor is. OK. Right now, we're imagining what eyes are actually capable of. And there are two degrees of freedom. Yeah. But, if, but a super crazy alien eye could have three degrees yeah. of freedom. Like, well, technically, yeah, eyes do have a little bit of a role. Yeah. But, uh, but but it can have that just relative to the eye. It doesn't have to be relative to the body. That's my, my question is about this other reference frame point. Um, uh, I, I, or unless you're calling like the eye socket another reference frame. So a movement can be relative to... Um, I guess that's relative to the head in that case, in my example. I th like I think what you're getting at is valid that like um, a movement is in the reference frame of it, it, it's in the, it is in the reference frame of the sensor. Uh, a movement yeah. is not in an external reference frame. Right. Um, so, and a, and um, and a rotation is a type of movement. And a rotation. I, I, is can I just this way? Orientation. When we talk about orientation, we, we're talking about something physical that is in, that is located in a space like a like a Good cell space or XYZ space, and then there's some point where this thing is physically located, and then at that point, any movement you can make by staying in that point is is to change in orientation. So I, I think so. So you can say it, it, that's that's how I view it. I don't know if that's consistent with your. I think it's consistent with your definition up here. And, and so you could say, oh, uh, the point is the point of my head, the, the space of my head. My eye is on uh, one point. And so my eye doesn't move relative to my head. It's at one point relative to my head, but it's changed every time it moves. It's changed the eyeball. It's changing its orientation to my head. I would qualify. Um, I could change my you know, eyeball relative to the room. I could, you know, any one of those. I think that to me, that what it is, any change in the physical position of this thing that doesn't change its its location in in some metric space uh, qualifies. Where the last one here. Uh, doesn't the last one here is just a direction, right? That's all it is, just a direction as you pointed out there. Um, um, so does that help putting it that way? That's how I think of it. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, what you're saying makes sense. I, I guess one of the one of the things to settle on or consider is: do we ever want to use the word orientation to describe this? No, uh, I, I vote no. Okay, <laughs> and and I, I sort of I sort of I sort of um, tried to give you that view. The way I drew this was intended to try to make you vote. Well, I would agree with that. Although I might have been guilty in the past of being sloppy about it. But, uh, but you were using the terms from other papers anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, but Subutai's point is an interesting one that um, these orientations are always in. An external reference frame, but they're not—they're not in the reference frame of the sensor, uh, just because that—that wouldn't—that'd be meaningless. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you can say the same thing about the lo location of the sensor. Um, location of the sensor is always in an external reference frame. Yeah. It, it can't yeah. be on its own. Um, now, kind of a unifying statement we could make, make now about movements. Um, movements can be in the reference frame of the sensor. Well, how? Well, I mean, they are. They are. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't move. If, 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 your if, I, if my sensor. eyeball, if, if in the reference frame of my eyeball, my eyeball can't be moving in the reference frame of my eyeball. It's always in the same spot, the reference frame of my eyeball. But, 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 the, but the movement itself is in the reference frame of the, of the eyeball? Yeah. Like right, I, now my, right now, I'm making a forward motion in the reference frame of my body. Uh, uh, wait, 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 wait. The, the body, the eyeball is not moving in the reference frame of the eyeball. Okay. Right? So imagine this eye can float around. <laughs> um, what's the right way to say this? No, if I attach a reference frame to the eyeball, by definition, it can't move relative to that reference frame. It, 
the eyeball is the reference frame. It can't move without looking at that. So if I say, where's my eyeball in this room? Sure, it can move. Uh, where's my eyeball relative to my head? Sure, it can move. So my, my example of using my body was was a good, was a valid example then. In my in the reference frame of my body, I'm making a forward motion yes. right now. Um, uh, no, 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 you're not. Not in the reference frame of your body. The reference frame travels with your body. Right. But yeah, but you can you still have a distance in your body's reference frame that you will move. Of course, the reference frame will move with it. But there's well, there, there is a distance if, in that reference frame. No, no. Well, you could say that, but you can't occupy that. If I say that there's a there's a space three feet in front of me, and I walk three feet forward, I'm not in that space. The whole reference frame moves, and so there's always a space. Yeah, but, you can, but that three feet forward still has a location in the reference frame of your body, even though when it, you move it, there. It, it's, it, 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 but it's not. You can you can say there's a position three feet in front of me. Yeah, but I can't occupy that. No, you can't occupy that. But so you can say I'm going to move three feet in front of me. No, you can't say that. You can say I can move three feet uh, relative to the room I'm in. I, I, it, you could, I mean, you can say I'm walking no, forward, but, uh, but if, if uh, imagine I'm floating in space, and it's just me and there's nothing else in the universe, right? Uh, how can I say that I've moved? Forward. I mean, if, if only the reference frame is me, I, there's no definition. That's just all of your your entire vestibular system, your motor command, your uh, no, but I, I mean, uh, my vestibular all, system all would those, pick that up because I'm in space. There's nothing else. So your no, motor command. There's no gravity anywhere else. Everything. I can't. I can't move against anything else. All on is me. So I can't move. I can't. My vestibular system. There's no gravity. Nothing. So uh, look, I think it's. I, I, I don't think this is important. Motor point. commands are an egocentric reference. I, I think. I think. Um, the point is that you can't, a, a, a sensor cannot move in its own reference frame. You can say, I'm going to move to a point that was there, and now, but, but that, that new point is in the reference frame of the room. It's not, it, the three feet in front of me point moves with me. I can't move, I can't occupy that space because it's always three feet in front of me. I happen to be otherwise. A, a, a movement in the sensor's reference frame has the effect of moving the reference frame itself. Okay, I think, why, what's the point of that? The point of this, it seems a silly thing to, to say because all that matters is, is really where my new location is going to be in some other reference frame. That's the important thing. Um, it's, all the information you have available to you, though, is, uh, uh, is in the sensor's reference frame. Why do you say Your that? Your efforts copy is in the sensor's reference frame. But, oh no, the efforts copy says you're going to move this, it says you're going to move at certain rate at some, uh, do these muscle motion commands. In fact, I kind of view movement as sort of like, the brain doesn't really even have any idea what it is in the cortex. It just says there's some thing that I'm going to send out and it's going to change something. And so it doesn't know it's walking, it doesn't do it, it doesn't know anything. It could be virtual, like, you know, mathematicians thinking. So the idea is that you just send out some, some signal that says, and then what's my new location? Um, that's how I view it. I don't feel like, oh, I'm walking three feet forward. It's just like I'm sending out a signal and what's my new location in this room or what's my new sensation as I move. I'm not sure we should argue about this too much. I was just trying to integrate with Subitas. Uh, my the point is, the point is, is it's, it's not really useful calculating anything in the reference frame of the, um, you know, movements in the reference frame of the sensor. The whole point is we have to figure out where the sensor is going to be after it moves and that where it's going to be has to be in a reference frame of something else. So the, the only value in moving uh, is to know your new location in some other reference frame. Uh, otherwise, you could say, all right, I'm going to move to the point that was in front of me three feet from now, but that's not useful to know. I need to know where that is in this room, right? You need to know where it is relative to the sensor if you want to generate motor behavior. Mm -hmm. The only result is where I am in this room. That's the only thing that matters, right? It doesn't, it, that's the thing that matters. I can't. If all I have is a reference frame around my eyeball, I can't do anything. I have to know where I am relative to other things. So uh, I don't know if this is an important debate. Um, all I'm saying is to me, there's, when we have a physical object, the point of it, it can have its own reference frame, but the point of it, it needs to, it, the thing we need to know is its location and orientation in some other reference frame. The point of it, that thing moves. Maybe another way to think about this is, um... Maybe to unify these points, of, uh, just to make it really concrete. If if you're moving from this point in the room 
three feet forward to that point in the room. The motor movements you make are identical to if you were here moving forward three feet. Yeah, totally. So there is. Uh, so you don't want to have to learn the motor movements for this separately. I agree with that. I agree with that. that. So you need to be able to translate all of these. But I don't think of that. I don't, I don't think of that movement as. Uh, 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 by, by reference, I think term. you know that the terminology thing yeah. maybe, but uh, ultimately from the practical standpoint, you want to be able to translate it into the same forward movement. I agree. I agree. So, it's, that's it's, kind so of, to me, the way I the way I would say that is, I send the signal to the body, and the body does something. That same signal, you know, it could be done here, yeah, it could be yeah. done there. The signal to the body isn't moved to this point in your reference. I mean, that's not the way I think no, about but, it. But you you would have to recognize somehow that okay, this is. I'm just moving three feet forward. I know how to do that. Well, I'm just moving three feet forward. I know how to do that. Yeah. Where I am in the, I'd have to convert from the allocentric viewpoint into this three feet forward. All right. I guess I guess I don't even think I have to convert. I just say I'm going to do something, and the result of what I do is going to be the, you know I have to understand this, the similarity between this one and that one. Um, I don't have to think about it as an allocentric reference frame. It's just a behavior. Whatever behavior I'm doing is going to um, result in something. I'm yeah, but it can't be dependent on the point. Okay, no, no, of course not. Yeah, yeah. But again, I think I think movement is only have to be physical, right? I, I, I've been thinking a lot about mental models and thinking in your head and thoughts and so on. So, you know, when I'm thinking about something and my thoughts are moving through a chain of thoughts, I am moving. I am executing a movement command, but it's not really physical moving anything. I just there's part of my cortex saying, "Here's an output from layer five. What's well, the new location?" You know, after I do that, where am I? That type of thing. All right. So I think as long as you don't, as long as you don't divide up our theories about the, using talking about the reference frame or the sensors, um, as as a as long as we don't focus on this issue, I think we're fine. We can we can even agree to disagree slightly about this. Um, I don't think any of that impacts what I was arguing. I was arguing that that in both these cases, the two left panels, uh, we're talking about something physical thing in this case. Doesn't matter if it's an eyeball or, or a prism or whatever that is, um, and um, that thing has a location and orientation relative to some other reference frame. And orientation, what happens is what happens when you move and not change your location. Um, you know, you're staying in one position and you move, and you can rotate around, and open around, and so on. And the direction is um, vector that's relevant. You know, uh, relative to some true north or some other, uh, you know, uh, an external yeah. direction. Well, so orientation would be true in that case. I mean, that would be true. The orientation of the left ones too, right? We need a, we need a reference or, um, you know, true north, or something like that. We need to know if we're going to measure it. We have to know, right? You know. Okay. I mean, these things are so simple in Cartesian coordinates. That they're all you can just. Precisely specify all of these things. Um, yeah, but then you you but you need an origin. Yeah, we need an origin. Something. Yeah, we become very very adverse to origins. Yes, yeah. unless someone wants to make an arguments, <laughs> just come back to them. <laughs> well, I feel like a lot of the tr some of the concepts transfer. Is is this the extent of what the main point you want to talk about? Yeah, okay, yeah, it's a very it's short topic. Then. Yeah, it was. It's just yeah. Uh, it's good okay. because I think yeah. this, these are confusing. So we need to kind of catch us, catch ourselves when we if we use direction and if we use orientation instead of direction. Yeah, we kind of, uh, need to be uh, just careful about yeah, that. Yeah, careful about that. So, um, I don't know if I want to bring this up or not. Because um, I've asked this before and you've answered it before and I'm just still finding it confusing. You know, this, the work you've been doing recently, Mark, is okay, they're trying to show, well, head direction cells look like this one dimensional thing, and, uh, and the animal can move in three dimensions. So, oh, well, we can explain the operation of the head direction cell by having some compass vector, or a, what do they call it? True north gravity vector? Gravity vector. Sure, yeah. Or, uh, what, what's your preferred term? I, I call it, um, I, I go back and forth between gravity vector and reference vector. Okay, well, I like reference vector better because it doesn't have to do with gravity. No, that's that's the that's the more general yeah. general version of it. Uh, okay, so it's a it's a reference vector. Uh, it's still not clear to me 
that seems like okay. So we have a we have a we have to represent three D orientation. Now head direction cells represent one of those dimensions. And so now there's two of the other dimensions that are still sort of wrapped up into this you know reference vector. Uh, and I have no idea where that is in the brain and the cortex and the column. I I don't really understand how I read out from that. Um, and so, so I've asked you this before, like, okay, if I want to read out from this, and I think the answer you've given before was, well, I can come up with a trivial neural mechanism, but you never really, you don't really think it's true. I think that's what you said. Or when I say I don't think it's true, I also don't think it's false. I, I don't uh, have, uh, I, I just don't. So let's, so let's go back to that in a moment. Now, now we have the same problem with grid cells. In that sense, grid cells are a two-dimensional um, point, and actually we don't even quite understand how they do that, but um, but but they're clearly two dimensional, and so the question is, well, how do you get three dimensions out of uh, that? And and then I was saying to myself, well, um, I believe that the it seems to me that the, 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 the possibility that this reference vector could be playing a role in both of those cases, and that, that we're using the reference vector for uh, the, the combination of a reference vector. And so I started thinking, like, well, what would happen to grid cells as the animal? was moving over the, the ball like in little animations you had, you know? And then, okay, imagine, we, you were saying, what happens to the head direction cells? Well, you can always imagine the head direction cells are always based on sort of this pole going through the bottom, through the top of the animal, right? So whenever it moves like that, and then like that. And so I was trying to imagine that it's the same, what happened, the same thing happened to grid cells? I don't know if you thought about that. But to me, this gets, there's a, just a key, key problem here is how do we get these three-dimensional location vectors and three-dimensional um, orientation vectors and, and how do they work together because we don't have origins and so um, you know maybe the, the best thing we can have is something like this reference vector that sort of ties them together um, we can't have origins to tie them together so maybe we can have that to tie them together so uh, i'm just throwing that out as a question uh, and if, if you've thought about it at all or, or um, if you think it's a good question or not a good question for me, um, that I've thought about it for short periods of time, and it just doesn't um, it doesn't trigger any possibilities for me. I don't see it, and and my eyes don't light up. I don't see it. Do you want to do it once again? For humor me and tell tell me your 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 not not your solution for the three dimensional orientation. I know you you're saying you're not against it. You're not for it. You're, yeah. You know, can you go through that again? Oh, I'm just going to say something quite. Trivial. Here, I always say uh, that, and I but, never remember it. So. Oh, uh, well, I'm just saying that, like, um, that okay, um, this is a the surface of a sphere. Imagine there are cells distributed over it. When I say this, I'm sorting them visually like this. They're not actually located in 3D, uh, and the column, unless maybe they are. The like, basically, the reference vector is a set of cells that topologically. Uh, there's a bump somewhere on the surface of this sphere. There's a bump of activity uh -huh. somewhere on the surface of the sphere. Yeah. Um, and this is like in, in the context of an animal and with gravity, this is just the direction of gravity or the direction of up or something like that. Yeah. And then otherwise, you get the equivalent of head direction cells, which is a bump somewhere in a ring. How is the first one? Uh, okay, so there's a magic bumpy sphere. We, yeah, <laughs> it's just like yeah. okay, let's make that up. Um, sure, that would encode it, right? Yeah. Um, how is it different than it looks? Reminds me a lot of just like a grid cell in the sense that um, uh, in any direction you go, it wraps around. Um, uh, it could be a continuous attractor. Um, how is it different than a grid cell? Grid cell module. Grid cell module. Yeah. Uh, Easy. Uh, uh, you, didn't draw and, it as a, you didn't draw it as a torus. Analytics. Like, <laughs> well, you, you just pretty much said that, like, topologically, one of those is a torus and one of them is a sphere. And so, so can you let's explore a little bit? So I understand <laughs> it at one level. That's the Virgo influence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can understand it at one level. I can understand when I look at a picture like this, but now I'm trying to unfold this into two-dimensional sheet of cells, right? So I can I have a vision of a two-dimensional sheet of uh, continuous attractor on a two-dimensional sheet of cells we call a grid cell module, and and what you're saying is okay that you can move in any direction on that and it wraps around that's a torus. Yeah, it's not clear why that's a torus and not a sphere. I, it's not intuitively obvious to me. I, I can sort of work it out, but I haven't internalized it yet. So yeah. 
what, why, and, and what would this look like if I flattened it out? Um, um, you can't really flatten it, I don't think. It, right, you can't really flatten it, and the, that's that's kind of why a sphere isn't good for representing location. Is there's no good way to map, you know, two D space onto a sphere. Okay, like so kind of but terms. but yeah, you have the same problem here. We're gonna we're trying to represent this two D orientation onto a sphere, and so we need some representation that's like that. Um, and it and and this is like a continuous attractor on the sphere. This 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 point relative to the gravity uh, to the reference vector. Um, so so a, a direction is inherent. So this is basically a direction and you know a point on the ring. Uh, dir a directions like the the topology of a set of possible directions is a sphere. Like so how would I implement this? In there? I don't think there's a ball of cells in the, that. If, if I want to implement this as a continuous attractor network. I think I have to. Yeah. Um, I think. I don't know. Or at least one, one guess. It's one guess. Uh, that's where we might start. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't see how I could implement that in neural tissue uh, because unless you're suggesting there's a ball of continuous attraction. No, it doesn't have to be physically laid out as a sphere. Well, it, it just yeah, of course it, it doesn't. Because some of the connections, as long as you allow some of the yeah. axons to be longer than others. Yeah, but then it's, then it's a very weird how would the, the, how would they get that get established, you know, it's like brain uh, brains don't really like to do things like that. Um, uh, I mean, the whole point of um, hmm. well, if I can make my connections any way I want, then I could lay this out, right? Yeah. Um, it's sort of like taking a, a map of the earth and putting it on one of those uh, you know, flat projections. It gets all distorted, but it doesn't really matter as long as uh, you're, you, know, you, you have the right sort of connections at every point. You could tell your, your spacing can get wider and you know, the edge it goes down like this. So, uh, so you'd have to learn it because it, it, you're right, it would have to be learned. Otherwise, it's such a bizarre, uh, you know, you have large discontinuities uh, uh, in its mapping. It, it doesn't, that doesn't make me happy. To think about it, like, okay, I can just flatten this out and just make the connections work. Well, fine. I could, then you could put the cells anywhere in the brain and it doesn't really matter where they are. <laughs> just make the connections work. Um, uh, it, just, it just doesn't strike me as right. It, it, it feels, you know, it could be, but it's, I don't think we're getting at it there. There's something else going on. <laughs> it feels like it. something else going on. Um, yeah. I mean, it's interesting that we see these uh, one-dimensional high direction cells everywhere, right? And we even have sort of evidence from the cortex. You can think of it, you know, orientation cells, maybe, I don't know. But we, no one's ever reported any kind of, you know, cell like, you know, cell properties like that. I would say that, um, if anything, that all this does exist and it, does, uh, it has been reported, but it's quite often the cells are strange, like conjunctions of the two, sometimes there. Oh, hold on, let me think about this. Yeah, that's the best answer I can give. You think people have seen this? Yeah, uh, especially in bats. Well, so in bats, have they described it this way? Okay, when I, when I say people have seen this, I'm saying people have seen cells that are tuned to the 3D orientation in various ways. So some of the cells probably look something like this, some look something like this, and some are just messy in between cells. I'm not saying anyone has found um, this exact model. Could, for this example, could, could you have also said, hey, I have, th I have three one-dimensional um, uh, cell populations, and, um, uh, and and I don't, and, and that's sufficient too. And I would, and, and then I'd see cells that would be tuned to various things. I mean, I mean, does it really imply that it's got this, you know, sphere like behavior? Or is it just saying that we see cells that seem to respond to 3D orientation? It's, it's more the latter. It's yeah. The, so that doesn't tell me it looks like that. No, it, could, it, could, it could look like something else. No. But uh, I will point out that uh, although I still don't know very much about how the vestibular system encodes your, the direction of gravity, it encodes the direction of gravity. It, it, which is inherently something like this. I don't know exactly how well, it Well, the vestibular system has three rings, literally three rings mm -hmm. that are orthogonal. 
So it's physical three, physical one dimensional. <laughs> um, but the, circular the, the tubes. Stimulus, the, the gravity is a two dimensional thing. Okay, got it. I don't, I don't know how. It, well, the stimulus system is not a gravity thing. The vestibular system is a, uh, uh, a you know, a, a, a three dimensional, um, what do you call it? Uh, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. Um, a gyroscope type of thing. Yeah. It, it basically, it's, it's three rings that are filled with fluid. And, and as you move in any, as you change your orientation at all, the, the fluid moves in the different rings differently, depending on, you know, so if you, if you rotate just purely in the plane of one, it's only a fluid moves in there. So it's, it's literally three tubes of water or fluid. Um, so there's, okay. Now, I don't know if there's a separate gravity detector. So that's the thing. There like, might but, be. But, but those are two different. One is this detecting differences in movement, and the other is detecting this always present force. Uh, and, and I'm talking more about the always present present force. Mm. Yeah, I don't think, of course, we can use that at all in the cortex. Um, right. But so, so maybe that's why I'm dismissing it. You know, it might be what's going on in, in the line of cortex. And in, in my mind, if something like this is in the cortex, this is replaced by uh, detecting the general axis of an object. The, the main axis yeah, 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 yeah. is basically taking the yeah. place of this. But but it, the whole representation would be different too. I mean, um, yeah. Hmm. Well. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think we can agree on what orientation is. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny if I think about head direction cells. I don't know if this. Is there any evidence in, in like in the antheronic cortex or subluctum or wherever they find them um, that they actually are arranged in any kind of ring? Or, is, or you know, if I think about like or, orientation cells in the cortex, they're not arranged in a ring. They're just sort of a continuous transition. Um, it's more like a one-dimensional, um, you know, repeating pattern. Um, we always draw them like this. Is there any evidence that actually are any kind of, I mean, how would we think the real head direction cells in, in, in the brain look like as spaced out? I mean, you know, I mean, we know that for the grid cells, like you can say, oh, like the tank paper, you know, you can just go over, cell, one cell over, one cell over, one cell over, and you see what they respond to. Mm -hmm. Have they done the same with head direction cells? I haven't seen anything suggesting that in mammals, um, they're arranged in a ring. In Drosophila. Uh, yes, I know that. Yeah, so. In Drosophila, it seems that you can actually observe them at, actually in a, in a ring. Yeah, room. I know. Well, a ring would minimize the, the length of all the axons. So in some sense, there's yeah. a, it's less energy or less resources yeah. to arrange it that way. But again, when it comes to cortex, it may not be that way at all. No. Um, um, I mean, it's surprising if, if this was a common uh, if it really were arranged like that, do you think someone would have seen that or observed it? Or, I mean, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I look, like a bunch of people have done it grid cells, right? They literally just say, okay, what's the next grid cell over? What's the next grid cell over? What's the next grid cell over? Why haven't they done that with the head? Drive? I mean, it was pretty recent with grid cells. They, did, they had to get this calcium imaging in place and be mm -hmm. able to look at it in the tissue. Whereas, mm -hmm. like, where, when you're doing all this with electrodes, I think they have a much harder time. You can't know which cell you were recording for right. an electrode. Yeah. Yeah. It's still surprising. I mean, you think it'd be some someone who would have wanted to do this. I mean, head direction cells have been known for a long time and people study them and people still study them. And things like you just think like someone would have discovered that. Well, I mean, it's a clue, right? It, it's a clue to how the whole system works. Uh, if you know how it's arranged, just like with grid cells, it's a big clue when you see how they actually arranged out. It's a, Important part of the puzzle. Um, hmm. So I, I'm going to ask you if you've run across anything in the literature. I, I doubt you have, but I'm going to ask you again. Um, so this, the recent stuff you've been talking about, where you're showing your animations of the rat on the ball and the, and the whole idea of the rotation around the, the, the stick going, I don't know what you call it, going through the body of the rat. Um, um, has anyone done this similar experiment with grid cells uh, in that same sort of like, setup? 
you know, like how do the grid cells change when the animals have different inclines and different positions in a 3D space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a couple, uh, they, they're they hard to interpret, but yeah, um, I would say the same person, Kate Jeffrey's lab is specializing in that with rats, various types of that. And another lab, the Olenovsky lab is doing it with bats. Um, and so, um, the Jeffrey results can be divided into ones where, yes, the rat is walking on various inclined planes or climbing up walls, um, or a set of results where the rat is actually walking through like basically a jungle gym type, like big lattice, uh, big um, 3D space basically. It has almost free movement through 3D space. Um, so the first set of those, the ones where the rat is walking on the plane, you can look at it and interpret it in a lot of ways. The grid is sort of messed up by walking diagonally. It's if you look at the pictures of the firing fields, it's hard to form conclusions. They sit, they're still it's kind of hexagonal. They're not really cleanly hexagonal with what was going on on the floor. So it changes. Yeah. Uh, yes. But really, if you go in with a bias, like you expect it to, see, to be the same, you're going to conclude it's about the same. If you go in with a bias that's going to change, it's going to be different. It, it's hard to reach a conclusion, at least from looking at the pictures. Of it's, but one, if I just was trying to use that as an analogy, I say, oh, maybe grid cells work the same as head cells. So then I could say, okay, well, then they're only going to change when the animal is moving in its plane, its body plane, you know, like wherever plane it's on, it's moving in that. So that would say if I, if the animal were moving like this, the grid cells wouldn't change. In the, in the, by analogy to how the, the head direction cells only change when the animal rotates around its, its, its the pole going through its back. Um, uh, and so even if its orientation changes, but it's, it's personally not rotating around its own pole, um, then uh, that's the key thing. So then the analogy here would say, okay, well, the grid cells will only change if I'm walking forward in my plane or walking backwards or you know, whatever. Um, but therefore, but I could be moving through the room at some, at some angle or something like that, and that wouldn't change. Uh, it's weird. It's, it's just like the grid, the, the head direction cell is a little bit weird the way it turned out to be, but so be it, that's what it is. So I'm just trying to figure out, is there something equivalent to that? You know, how do I get the three dimensionality out of the grid cells? Um, um, and, uh, and I guess it's, and yeah, those are the kind of thought processes I was having. It's not at all clear. It, none of it made sense to me, but I was just trying to try that out as an idea. It's like, oh, could I explain that? Could I use the same thing uh, going on with grid cells as, you know, by analogy to what's going on with head direction cells? Um, then a slightly similar set of results rather than um, uh, another one where the rat is still moving on a plane, but this time the plane is the wall. Uh, so I'm not going to have full 3D movement yet. Um, I don't know the best way to draw this. Let's, let's say there are two, um, two areas for the rat to walk. This is the wall. This is the floor. There's a 90 degree angle here. Yeah. Uh, there are, if a grid cell has like, you know, hexagonal fields on the floor, uh, let's call that a hex gun. Um, on the wall, it becomes, um, if, if the rat grew up climbing walls, if the rat like, uh, is an experienced wall climber, so they have like this ch chicken wire uh, on the walls, um, the field, it does have fields here, but they're more like big, like, like a big field will be here. Um, Basically, it's like this. It's like the scale in the third dimension is different. Um, that's one. But it is a field. It yeah, is, um, it's a field. It's not. Um, it, but in some of the in their other older results where the rats were less experienced with all this climbing and stuff, um, often they weren't fields. They were big pillars. They were big. Um, they were big. Like, like the whole whole section of wall would have a good cell fire. I mean, in, in another one where if if the rat yeah. was climbing up. Uh, it's hard to. I was going to draw if the if the wall has a set of pegs coming out of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Then they found that the fields were something like this. Hmm. Uh, that that was so, the older result. This is this just came out a couple. Well, the of idea that there might be a, a a cell over the whole wall is, is something intriguing. That's kind of what I was getting at here. Imagine again, I'm following the analogy of the head direction cell stuff you've been reporting on. So in uh, and so the head direction cells are. 
you know, they act weirdly in three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the things, you know, they only look normal in two-dimensional space, but the real behavior is weirder than that. So it's like, okay, we, let's not get hung up on the normal, what we think about what they normally look like, because it's not right. Um, and so the same thing could be going on in grid cells. So by analogy here, if, I, if the animal could somehow get on an elevator and move off the floor, um, it would be changing its location, but in turn, it, I, I think it wouldn't be changing its location. However, if the animal was vertical and, and was going up a wall, I have to think about this. I, all I want to say is that we have this, we, we now know the head direction cells are weird. They're not like we thought they were. Uh, they, the, the way you think of they are is a, is a projection from three-dimensional space of some sort. And then maybe the grid cells are also weird. But not like we think they are, and they're also maybe a projection from three-dimensional space. And maybe you have to look at grid cells and orientation cells at the same time to know anything. It's like maybe I, I'm just making this up, but this is how I've been thinking. It's like maybe you can't think about location and orientation separately. There is maybe there's this one thing, which is your location and orientation, and um, and the, we have these separate projections that look like you, you've separated them out, but really not. And they're really they combined somehow. Because um, I, 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 these are the ideas I'm running in my head. I, I don't know if any of them are any good, but uh, just, there's something, it's obviously really weird. This, this world of these cells is different than, than the simple explanation that we've been given. Um, and it doesn't work, or can't get them to work, so maybe this weirdness is important. Um, anyway, it's, I'm just sharing some thoughts. Um, I don't have an answer to them. I've been trying. <laughs> Third set of results that made us most uncomfortable, us being me and Mirko and Ela, uh, is now if the rat is climbing through like 3D space because it's climbing through basically this big toy structure yeah. that I'm not going to be able to draw. Yeah, but like, yeah. But yeah lot, lots of these interconnections. Anyway, um, the constant lattice, the animal can walk in basically different three or four different directions from any point. Um, there, the, the grid cells have these 3D firing fields, these 3D blobs at various points in space. Uh, so they're not these pillars, they're, they seem to be these blobs, um, but they're not very neatly organized. They don't form any obvious lattice. They don't form any nice hexagonal thing. Yeah. So there's that. So, you know, so that brings up a thought to me too. The whole point of the grid cells, in my mind, um, the entire point of them is that you need to be able to do a map. And the point of the map is that a particular behavior, when you execute a behavior, you need to know the next, the next point in the map. That's all it really is. Um, by, by thinking about a, a uniform field, well, then you can Thanks say, oh, I can follow. apply those anywhere in this room. I can apply the same behavior, and I can figure out my next point, my next point in the map. So I, if I know I'm over in this location, I'm before I know what my point will be over there. The location point will be. When the animal is working in a weird environment like this, where there's a little pet, it can't go everywhere. It's not. It can't. It's not like a little space jet suit that you can go anyway. It can only go certain ways, and it could learn. That, okay, in this environment, all I need to know is where my new location will be. It doesn't really matter where that location is and everything because I just have to know where I'm going to be so I can know what's there. And so it doesn't have to be this linear, nicely um, uh, uniform space anymore. It just has to be a mapping from motor behaviors to locations. Uh, and that's all that matters. Um, now, like if, there's a discrete set of locations there. Yeah, now if the, if the rat had really good vision, like I think for us, Imagine I had a couple places I could climb around this in this room, like a cat you know, tower, you know. Like, <laughs> uh, and I would still, but I could any point in there, I could look around and see the entire room. And so, for me to make predictions about the entire room, I have to know my location in a, uh, a, a very uh, linear three D space. The rat may not be like that. The rat, you know, has poor vision. It's got its whiskers. Um, and so it may not be able to look at the entire environment and look around. It may only see a little bit in front of it. And in which case, that's good enough. I'm just pointing out that if I was in that environment, I would still need a, a linear 3D space mapping because I could look around anywhere from any point in there and see the entire room. And I have to be able to make predictions about what I'm going to see. And I can make those predictions. Therefore, I have to be able to, I have to know where I am in the room in a linear, uh, clean way. Um, 
Whereas if I was, uh, you know, the rat on that little climbing structure, the rat may be thinking more like, oh, it's like, it's like the hallway downstairs. You ever take the hallway out, downstairs out to get out of the building, right? Sure, I basically have but. Okay, so it's a complex set of hallways to get out, right? While I'm going through those hallways, I actually don't know where I am in this building. It's, yeah, it's, very, I kind of, it's, very, confusing. it's very confusing. I have some general idea, but, I, but I've lost the, the map of the building. So all I really learned is, oh, there's a hallway. I know this hallway. I need to get to that point in this hallway. Oh, now there's that hallway. I need to get to that point in the hallway. So the rack could be like that. Rack climbing out of these little things might be like me going down the hallway to get out of the building. It's like, I don't really know where I am in the building. I can't say what's above me. Um, that's, that's a good analogy. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful about that. Where a human, if I was in, suspended in the porch of this room, I would know exactly where I am in the room. Uh, and therefore, I'd expect my, uh, uh, yeah, my, I, I would expect not to have these blobby or odd grid cells. I expect my grid cells to be, to be very good. Um, Maybe we still don't know what very good is. In well, my point is, maybe I would say that what they, uh, maybe I was reacting to the fact that they got more diffused and blobbier. Yeah, uh, or really the complaint is that they're not uniformly spaced, or they're not, they don't form a nice lattice, they don't form a nice... Oh, lattice. I thought you were drawing that they're actually going to firing fields. Oh, uh, right now you're, okay. Um, right now maybe you're talking about this one. Oh, uh, yeah, well, uh, I was With climbing in the walls. Yeah. The uniform lattice, I could explain. Right, because again, that's like me being in the hallway downstairs. Yeah. The lattice wouldn't be uniform anymore. Right. But uh, the fact that I have larger firing fields, like really blobby ones, that, that was what I was reacting to. If it's just the fact that they're not uniform, I'm gonna, I could chalk that up to the fact that the rack is like, it's like in the hallway downstairs. Um, it, 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 the, you know, I lose track. You know, you don't really. All I need to know is where. Yeah, I've already talked about. It. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the the larger fields might not even be a problem. It might just be saying that. We don't remember as precisely the height of things as we do the um, the, yeah, the position maybe. on the floor. Yeah. Like it might not actually be might be an issue. But it's really interesting. I mean, I guess it would be fascinating to know what happens to grid cells as you know. I guess we're doing this with rats, and I mean, it would be like if I could just you could read out my grid cells of me my head being down on the floor my head going up and up here and mm -hmm. here you know how do the grid cells map into this 3d space um where well, I have a really good sense for it I mean if I stand on the stool I know where I am in this room it's not like I'm looking confused and I'm, I can make I can even imagine what the room's going to look like right now I can, I can imagine what I would see standing on the stool and so I, I got a good model and it works um so I would have pretty precise p positioning up um, and I think this is core to the whole problem here, um, these representations and how they tie together. Uh, can I just say, ask one more thing? Yep. Uh, this is a question I might be able to have on this. So I was, I was working through this sort of the compositional object problem here and, and saying, assuming we have no origins, right? We have no origins. But I have some, uh, imagine I have some, uh, this is all 2D. I have, a, I have a, a, a reference frame for this object. I have a reference frame for this object. Um, uh, those reference frames, of course, are um, imagined using just grid cells, like our old method of grid cells, a bunch of grid cell modules. So the same grid cell modules can represent, they can represent this, they can represent this. Uh, these are different orientations from one another. So I have to somehow represent that. Um, so like a movement in this direction here changes things differently than in here. But the question I have for you is the following. If I, um, if I could tell, if I could figure out the orientation of this reference frame to this reference, this being the room, if I could figure out the orientation of A to the, to the parent object, um, and I had something of, of, of similar to like our displacement cells, which don't work in this situation, is that sufficient? Do I need anything else? Is, is, is that all the information I need to do a mapping from point here to point here and point here and point in this reference frame? Is there anything else I need? Um, I mean, I guess the question is, is this a sufficient description of the problem? Um, uh, you know, is, if, if I have those things, do I have enough information? What, what information do I need to, have, to answer this question? I don't have origins, so I can't say the origins. If I had origins, it might be easier. You don't need origins for it. Uh, yeah, for yeah. The, no, so all the information is here, right? All the information. No, um, I would say that. Okay, uh, what you just 
Maybe you mean something a little different. I don't really know. I'm okay. just trying to Well, if you want to know how this is oriented, oriented being like the three D orientation of this relative to the Let's parent Let's stick to two D orientation. Well. Sure. So the orientation is easy, right? I can represent that. I can represent that. Either. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a one orientation. It's a, yeah. It's, it's yeah. So okay. that that part's the we, you could call an angular displacement yeah. between yeah. this and yeah. this yeah. trivial to represent. Yeah. But I mean, you, it can be shown pretty clearly that that's not enough because what if the objects over here? What if okay. It's over so here? what am I saying? The following displacement. What, what am I saying? I say so. I guess here's the issue. If I imagine extending this uh, reference frame down here, and I say, okay, I'm at this point. I can say, what point am I in P, and what point am I in A? Yeah. Right. And um, if I if I knew that, and I know the orientation, that that seems to be sufficient because the, what I could do is then I could just say, okay, let's take this, uh, take, imagine I have a little screen here and I say, okay, this point of that screen and this point of this screen are going to be co-lined. Uh, and now I have to, to rotate it like that. I'm done. I've specified the position of these two relative to each other. That would be sufficient, right? If I could use, if I could somehow do all the math I needed to do, I could. Yeah, from a pure kind of information content, if you have, if you can, Know know that point where that point is in A, and yeah. at the same time know where that point is on P. Yeah, and you know the the rotation of A. Yeah. That should be enough. So 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 that's interesting. So that's sufficient. Um, the problem, and then if I knew if I was actually here and I moved, um, I could then determine where I am in A and where I am in P. That's that's and that's doable too. I could say okay, well. I know my my movement is, is in, in some direction to A and in some direction to P, and I can so if I if I knew if I was located, I could then move in any direction, and I and I could update my new location. But now I would be at um, uh, then I would be at some other location that's relative to A and P. Um, the problem I think we have here is how do I represent this such and that maybe another uh, kind of twist if you knew two points. Right, so if you know where point one is on A and where it is on P, yeah. and where point two is on A and where it is on P, you don't need the orientation. You can count yes. the the orientation. From that is, that's that's an interesting point. That's true. Um, okay, we can derive the orientation. You can derive. But let's say let's say we have this information now, and I have some position. Then if I if I just did path integration and I start moving. Um, and I know my orientation to let's say to P, if I know my orientation to A, I could continually update where I am. I would know where I am on A and where I am on P. There's no problem there. The problem we have is um, defining the relationship between A and P without specifying a point. That seems to be the problem, right? Um, it's like I, if I now this becomes the origin then. It's like, okay, if, if I'm gonna locate A relative to P by specifying this point, that point's a common point. Uh, and then from there on out, if I'm there, I can figure out how I'm going to get someplace else. But um, but that's not what we do. I mean, I, I I have to be able to sort of say, okay, right now I'm over here uh, on P, and uh, oh, let me look up where would I be on A, and I can't look that up. I can't. I can't. There's no way to. We don't know how to look that up yet. We if I if I told you it was a common point, I could navigate from there. Um, uh, or as you point out, I have two points, I can navigate, know that, but I can't just say, okay, how would I represent, how would I represent A, if I, how could I represent A relative to P if I just pick some random point P and say, where is it relative to A? I don't know how to do that. That's the problem. So the, the problem is sufficiently, if we have enough information here, if I can specify a point or two points, a point orientation, two points, um, but that's not what I want because I don't want to figure out where I am on A when I'm over here. I don't want to have to say, or well, maybe I don't think I do. I don't want to have to say, okay, how would I get back to this point? And then from that point, how do I get to, you know? To now, once you know this, that information is the mathematical way, there's a, there's a transform which tells you exactly how these two reference frames relate to each other. Yeah. And then from any other point, now you can do it directly. You don't have to go back to the previous ones. Is so that you're concept. saying what I have to. So the question is: Is that transform specified as this point here, or is there still? No. Well, well, it's a relation. It's like a displacement. Okay. Well, how do we do that? Relationship because between the reference points. That's what we're trying to do. That's what displacements did, right? Yeah. That, that was yeah. what displacements did. Yeah. So displacements are the most trivial form of transform matrix. 
Um, but I think because it transforms, they're specified in numbers, and numbers always have a zero. And that zero is important. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, then, and I think that point is. The so point. You, you're saying whatever you call it, there's going to be a point that's zero, and that's a special point. Uh, like the, you you can take any point on any of these that's the zero. Yes, yeah, so that's my point here. As long as I know one point, I'm good, right? Uh, but of course, but then, but you, yeah. But then you're you're going to basically using the knowledge about the distance from here to here. And the, it's implicit in the train. You don't have to explicitly calculate it. I don't. No. But, but, oh, because but, it's there because this is zero. The transforms operate point. on vectors which yeah. are always relative to some zero. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. So, so I'd say point. once you know, once you know the coordinates of this point in P. And you have the transform. You can figure out what those coordinates are in A. You don't have to go back to here. And do it. Well, it's just, you just apply the transform. But you're going back to somewhere. You're going back to. It's implicit in the transform. You're, you're, you're taking advantage of the knowledge that you know how far away this is, right? You have to know that. It's it's literally like a just it's like our displacement vectors. Well, our displacement vectors but, have no numbers in them. They're because a, tra a transform involves multiplication, um, and multiplication yeah. involves knowing. You might say something. Uh, a multiplication involves knowing how long a vector is, yeah. uh, knowing how far away it is from some point. Uh, and whereas displacements don't ever involve knowing how long a vector is, which is why they work without having to have a notion of a zero. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. No, it makes sense to me. No. It makes sense to me. I, I, um, it, I, think, I mean, I, you we can don't write get... down the transform so that given a that tells you how these two reference frames are shifted and oriented with respect to each other. You can just, this is very simple matrix you can write down. And now for any new point, you can figure out where that point is on, on the other reference frame. Like I'm given a coordinate in P, I can figure out exactly what the coordinates would be in A. And implicitly the coordinates are in, ref, in relation to some zero point. Yeah. Um, so that's you have, right. You have you to just, know. All you do is apply, the matrix to it, and you get the. But you do have to know these the distances series. from the zero. I mean, that's what it is. It's a distance from the zero point. Yeah, and you can even go the other way around. We don't know. Yeah. It, I think what Mark is saying is we don't. We don't know these distances. We never know the distances. You can't read them out. You yeah, you don't need to know the distances. Well, you do. It's a number. My, I have to know my position, which is relative to some zero. So it's. Yeah, uh, yeah, but you don't need to know the distance. You need to know the distance. I need to know the distance. You need to know the coordinates from some zero. Yeah, point. yeah, 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 yeah. So my point is, we don't have that. Yet. No. The neurons don't have any numbers like that. They just there's no encoding of we can we yeah. Can, but I think that I'm not sure how. I mean that that's important from a neural representation point of view. I think fundamentally you can still do the same thing. Well, if you can, I don't understand how because that's the key. That's the problem there. I mean, the challenge is what I don't know how to do is how to do it with within modules. Right. So we, you know we have our concept of grid cell modules, and you have the the collection of activity across the modules is what gives you. Imagine, the, the imagine you, let's, let, let's solve it without modules. Do it with one module. Let's say all we wanted to do is there's one module, this all fits within one module, so there's one bump that moves around in here, that's sufficient. Yeah, then it's trivial. How is that trivial from a normal point of view? I don't get it. I don't, I don't know how to do it either. All I have is a bunch because of cells. Because I can tell you what the matrix transform is. And if we don't have modules, you just have basic, you know, activity represents locations. Uh, you just, it's a mapping from one to the other. It's just a fixed set of uh, synapses that it can do it. It's easy. Well, I don't know how to do that. I have using, point, using a point neuron model. Okay, so basically. Because the point neuron model, all it does is a vector multiplication. Or vector, it's a dot product. So. You can just, you can just take the matrix and convert it into a network, and it's. What's the let's, let's, let's say I had one neuron. I mean, it's kind of what I did with uh, Lewis with for Nick with uh, inverse. It's this is really easy to do. Can, can we just say this? Imagine I have a grid here for the parent, and each each section of the grid has one cell. Yeah. Okay. That, that's our that's our yeah. represent. And then I have uh, I have the same thing for A. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now. Uh, how do I do this? <laughs> How do I say, all right, what is the what is the neural representation that says, well, given so you have to have another set of cells which represent the transform. Okay. And I, I, don't each have, of those I don't want to have a cell that represents the transform from every point here to every point there. That would be, I can't exhaustively uh, 
exhaust I don't want to have, you know, if, if, if there's N cells here and N cells here, I don't want to have N squared cells. Um, no, you wouldn't have N squared cells, but you might have N squared connections. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's optimal. Way I mean, we want some generalization here, right? I want to be able to say, I don't have to learn the transfer from every point here to every point here. If, if that's what you're suggesting, okay, maybe it could work. But I certainly don't want to learn that. I have to somehow generalize to say, here's a simple representation for the position of this to this, and now I can go from this neuron to that neuron um, in a generalized way. I guess if I learned it exhaustively, I get it. I can see how it would work. But we don't want to learn it exhaustively. Subutai, are you saying that you could, I'll, I'll use green and black as two different modules. Uh, when you're talking about these two mappings uh, between populations of neurons, I'll just draw two wrong by. Like, are you saying that one mapping would be, well, here, first I'll draw one that we know works. Uh, the pure displacement is, a, a, it maps this green cell to this black cell. Yeah. Uh, whereas, like the, no orientation and no scale change. Right. Whereas, uh, very talented writing right here. Uh, <laughs> um, wh whereas these other ones that are a little weirder, um, uh, imagine that's around this, yeah. uh, gosh, it's bad, but. Um, yeah. That's all right, it's just the only difference is scale and orientation. Yeah. Uh, and you're, not, you're, not, you're not changing scale, it's I didn't, translation. Yeah, it's just rotating, yeah, yeah, yeah. rotating it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, my stance on this is that this mapping you can't just map the, these green cells to these black cells because um, because I mean if you continue if if as you know the rat moves around it continues on to these other locations all sorts of mappings happen like uh, it, yeah so this wrap around I don't know how to that's what I was saying the module stuff I don't know how to do but, it, but forget about the modules for the moment it, isn't this are you, isn't what you're suggesting an exhaustive learning it's like I have to learn every position every position. Um, I mean, the nice thing about the displacement, they didn't have to do that, right? You could just, you have this one vector and that's it. You can no, I think you can do it with, um, you'd have to have a, the equivalent of a displacement logic for orientation. All right, well, that's, that's just what we were trying to get to. A displacement module for orientation is pretty simple um, uh, and can easily be imagined. So imagine I have a displacement module for orientation. So now I have a set of cells where um, uh, which cell active is basically representing the, ro the, the relative rotation of these guys. Okay, so I have that. Let's say I have that. So I have a cell, and maybe I have 10 different orientations. So I have 10 different cells that can be active that says, oh, it's perfectly aligned, bing, 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 bing something like that. Um, so let's say I got that. So I have, I have a, a orientation displacement. Uh, and that's, you know, that's yeah, but even in a displacement module, in order to have that work, you have to exhaustively learn all of those connections. Right? Every possible displacement has to be pre learned. Yeah, but the, uh, every possible displacement, but not every possible displacement at every possible location. Right? There's, there's only 10 displacements. And uh, I can learn them. Fine. Yeah, but you have to have connections to all the possible pairs that will cause that displacement. So you, you have to learn it exhaustively. Uh, Yes, but but okay. So so let's let's go there. So so uh, in ex in some extent, we had to do that with the old displacements here too. We had to learn. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah, but the challenge now is we want to do both of these. We want to do this kind of displacement and this kind of displacement. Yeah. And I don't want to do the combination. I don't want to do exhaustive between all of those. So if I have ten of these, and let's say I have uh, I don't know, let's say I have a hundred of those. Right? I don't have to learn a thousand things. I want to be able to somehow take, I just don't want to, I mean, I can't learn the whole point. Um, it's not that many. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, you learn it once. You don't have to learn it for every new environment. Yeah. Now, why doesn't this work with multiple modules? Uh, it's just a whole wraparound stuff and, um, and having, I, I just don't know. I'm, because if I can get to work, with, you, were, you had some way of doing it, uh, but you had, I think you had to do it across modules too. Yeah, I mean, I, I basically, I, I, I kept running with the grid cell trick yeah. of, uh, hey, let's connect grid cells that fire together. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, and when they fire together in this reference frame and that reference frame, uh, I, could, I could say this much better. But I extrapolated this idea to uh, use the same exact trick for orientation, uh, but it's limited in that. Um, but you, that but you, weren't, you, weren't ex you weren't discrete, uh, independently representing the orientation displacement. You were sort of doing it with, right? You were trying to capture, uh, you were trying to capture orientation within the same displacement cell modules or something like that. I, I, I have a separate ring for orientation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the limitation here was that it can only represent a set of special uh, yes. uh, relative That's orientation. Right. If you want to stick with the grid cell track. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, like, it could. Right. But why, 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 can't I have this, why can't I have this as many as I want here? I have a 10 of these and 100. I mean, because I'm, I'm taking advantage of grid cell firing fields landing on each other. Yeah. yeah. And that only happens in special circumstances. Well, why do we need to take advantage of that? Um, no, we didn't. No. If, if you don't want to use the grid cell trick, then it's then it's easier. But with the grid cell trick, then we get this uh, all of these unique representation object representations and um, and uh, where there's a finite amount of learning you do early in your life and then you can use it forever. So I, 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 I'm not disagreeing with anything you say, I'm just I'm confused about something. Imagine I say I'm going to just stick with one displacement module and one uh, one displacement orientation module, one displacement location module, and that's it. I'm not worrying about the wraparound. And I'm saying, okay, I'm just going to use those one modules, yeah. and and now I'm going to try to figure out my location and orientation using those two modules. Yeah. So with one module, you like uh, Marcus was saying, there's a limited set of orientation because of the sixty degree thing. There's only a fixed why do, number of orientations. Why, why is why is that true? I, uh, just that if you, I, I, I understand. You know, I, under, I understand at one level. I don't understand yeah. at the other level. I, I, I know. I understand why they line up as you go to these six. Well, there's areas. a discrete set of locations you can do, and it is a discrete set of angles that are possible for a fixed set of for yeah. a fixed size module. Um, yeah. So. so but, Unless we go into, I guess, with uh, you go into like real value number. But 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 I don't see why the discrete set of rotations have to match up to the those. Uh, why couldn't I have a hundred here? And and uh, and essentially, I'm saying, okay, given my point, I'm now going to you know displace and rotate. Uh, and now uh, I I got to notice if you I have uh, to map it on to the original. But so what? Um, if, you have a, uh, if you have a module. Fixed set of cells. Yeah. You know, I'm not drawing this correctly, but um, there are only 60 degree angles I, here between neighboring cells. So saying. if you want to move just a short distance, you can't possibly represent all the orientations. You can no, only represent no, six. Let's, let's say I'm willing to quantize the results. So yeah, then it's then that's the fixed set. Um, so I I will say that well um, I. Uh, this whole 60 degree thing doesn't depend on how many cells there are here. Like if, um, if suppose you actually were representing the actual coordinates of a bump, like in like floating point, like yeah. if you could, if you could do that and get the actual coordinates of like a bump in the orientation bump and yeah. floating point, yeah. the 60 degree thing will still hold the, the, um, the limitation the, I, I am doing that. I am doing a trick here, taking advantage of the fact that when you have two lattices at certain angles, they land on each, on each other. Uh, yeah, but that doesn't that depend on. Well, the point is by a floating point, then my lattices are are, yeah. are are very they're, they're continuous. I mean, they're I can represent points between those points, right? Um, uh, I mean, the, if I think about a. Does it depend on having cells with 60 degree orientations relative to one another? Um, uh, uh, no, no, it doesn't. Um, so you're saying even in a continuous sheet like that, yeah. you still have that? I don't yeah, that. I'm, uh, I'm taking advantage of, okay. Um, I'm finding the special cases where, okay. Uh, see, see here where I drew this green, um, this extra, yeah. Uh, here, Let, let's ignore. Let's erase this out. I said parts. Under with, with special angles, if I slice up this um, 
if I slice up this outside green one, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna slice up this part and move, move it um, like across to here. My point is, I can slice off, I can slice this up. I was, I'm trying a new explanation right now. It's not working. Let's go back. Um, Under certain under certain um, reference frame pairs, certain relative orientations, there is going to be a one-to-one -one mapping between a, a phase in this black rhombus and a phase in this green rhombus. Oh, I, I know where we're I know what we're doing. Why we're thinking about this different? I started by thinking the following. I was thinking, remember remember grid cells were not discovered right away. And, uh, um, and, and the one the reason they didn't discover them right away is because the fields are too far apart. The, the rep repetitive field was big. And, and so they, didn't, they had to go to a very big environment before they saw them. Mm -hmm. So I was in my mind thinking about this problem, like let's, let's say that I could fit all within one rhombus area. So that there's no repeating cells in this room you know, there's no repeating locations. So this is one cell active in each point in this room where, where there's a bone, blob of cells here and a blob of cells here. And, no, and, and those cells never respond anywhere else in the room. Because um, because the, the repeating rhombuses are bigger than that. The, the, that's how I was starting to think about this. Um, and in that case, um, there's just at any point in time, any point in this space, there's a bunch of cells active, but there's no 60 degrees because I don't get to the next firing field. Right? You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's that's what I was thinking about. I just have a blob of cells. These blob, this cell only responds to this area, and the next cell only responds to this area, and the next cell only responds to this area. And that kind of thing. In that scenario, none of the 60 degree stuff exists, right? Because it's all outside of the room. So I was trying to constrict this problem to that scenario, in which case there really isn't any grittiness yet. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Um, that's how I was thinking about the problem, and and that's why I think there's a, we're getting into confusion here. So I was asking a simpler question. Yeah. So so in that domain, like with displacement cells, each displacement cell learns all possible connections to pairs of you know other locations that correspond to that displacement. Right. So it's an exhaustive mapping, but once you've learned that. That set of the, the set of displacement cells will work in any environment. Okay, but now and I can do the same thing with orientation and displacement. It's a larger set. You well, I don't. Oh, I didn't want to learn is this times this. I think that's too much. Um, uh, but if I did, then of course I could learn. I could say, given any set of cells that are active here and some movement and some change in direction, I'm exactly where I'm going to be. be. Yeah. But that seems. But that seems it's not that not that much. Now, um, what if, okay, so this is another idea. So what if, what if we had to have pretty coarse coding here? So I try to reduce the amount of, the amount of learning I have to do. Um, and I'm just, I'm going through a thought experiment. And now I'm gonna have a whole bunch of modules, but I'm still no tiling in any module. I'm still gonna be, my modules are gonna be, you know, I'm gonna go to the next good cell orientation module, next good cell orientation module. But never, I'm still not dealing with any sort of repetitive fields within here. So what's the difference between those? Well, they would be, let's say, let's say the only difference is their anchor difference. That's it, the only difference. So maybe I have, you know, a thousand cells that represent this here and here, and another thousand cells here, and another thousand cells here, and where, and where the bump is, is just, if for each new room or object in the world, I just, uh, I pick a different, you know, um, so they're, they're, they're not anchored equivalent. So I can still do the sort of the grid cell module trick, where I can say each individual one is not unique. Um, it can be applied to many different objects, but the combination of them would be more unique. I'm just doing this as a thought experiment. Um, would that still work? Would I be able to read out um, um, I guess what you're saying here is if I had if I had uh, ten of these and a hundred of these, I'd have a thousand different cells that represent my my point in the orientation here. Mm -hmm. 
and have a thousand cells here, a thousand cells here. Um, if I had ten of these modules and I randomly, you know, I pick two from here, two from here, two from here, two from here, then I'd have a unique position and, and orientation. Um, in yeah, a much larger space. And a much larger, and much many more spaces. Many, 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 and higher number, uh, many more spaces. Um, that readout would be sufficient to uh, make a prediction. Yeah. Because it is unique to the object, and it's unique to the location, and it's unique to the orientation. What have I lost by assuming that that there's no grittiness here? Um, what have I gained? I don't know. What am I having? Um, well, you lose the capacity stuff. You you know the size of the environment that you can represent is much smaller. Uh, but again, remember it was so interesting. They didn't find them because the environments were smaller than the grid cells. <laughs> Spacings. <laughs> so, in the, in the first example we have of this, they were bigger, you know, they couldn't find it because it wasn't repeating. They had to go to the extremes to find the repeating. Yeah, so, cells. if you're okay with a smaller environment, yeah. you're fine. Uh, now, what if I started having a little bit of repeats? What if a cell was spotted here and here? Uh, what would be the problem with that? It would be like, okay, well, in this particular module, uh, I, I would be a little bit confused. Where yeah, I, I think the fundamental reason the way that orientation, the topology of orientation is more is different than the topology of just distances. Uh, and it's just hard to, <laughs> maybe that's the fundamental reason why it's just hard to do the great cell trick with orientations. Well, well, are you answering the question I just asked? I missed that. I didn't understand that. Well, you're saying why, what if it repeats? I said, so what if, I, I, okay, so I, I, I defined this a narrower problem. I say, well, there's no repeating anywhere. Um, um, and so in the grid cells, therefore I can, I can make this work. Yeah. Um, now I'm saying, okay, um, how do I stretch that and start, you know, what would be the case if I had a little bit of repeating just once, what would happen? Um, uh, that would say that if a cell becomes active and in this module, I can't tell from here or here. Um, and I, I, I don't know what would fail. If I move from one point, would I get confused as to where I am? Or, and if I was confused in this one, then um, if I had 10 of these modules, would the whole system get confused? Uh, I, I'm just trying to, you know, as opposed to, I'm starting with a pure case where it works. And then there's, there's a bad case where I have a whole bunch of repeating modules in here and then things get really screwy. But what's what's the next one is where my trapezoid just starts getting you know a little bit small, so I have a cell here and a cell there, and the same one. What would fail? Uh, um, um, would it fail? I have to think about that. Um, I mean, one way to think about this is is the following: What if there were a ton of little modules, a lot of little ones? Each one had very low resolution. Um, and um, and but I have a bunch of them. Um, you know, that would probably work as long as I have enough of them. I have enough of them, and uh, um, you know, they each they each are sort of independently aligned and independently placed on the object, and um, um, then I I could probably read out from the group of them. Um, well, this is an interesting idea. Uh, there's a, there's, uh, if you follow me, there's actually another comment. There's another possibility. I've considered it a lot the idea that the or head direction cells might have the same trick that we think grid cells have. That is, that you could have a whole bunch of different small head direction modules uh, because head direction cells seem to be all over the place. They're, they see them, you know, there's lots of them. So maybe there's a whole bunch of different modules. Each one is anchored differently uh, on a particular environment, let's say, by sensor input. So now if you read out, if you read out a bunch of cells from a bunch of these little modules, what you'd end up with is a representation of orientation that's specific to an environment. It would be, this is, uh, it, it would prevent, it would, it would exhibit path integration, but it would also say, this is your orientation in this particular environment. and 
I know how to predict what my next orientation would be if I move, but I would also know the environment. I could, I would know what room I'm in if those guys anchored differently. So you could have, you could have lots of head direction cells that are anchored differently in one grid cell, which is not anchored differently. <laughs> and, um, then you would know. <laughs> what would you know? I don't know. Uh, or you could have a mix of both. Um, so I'm just I'm gonna maybe leave it at this. I'm gonna say like here's something we could have. You could have um, a whole bunch. That's what I was trying to draw in this picture up here. This is what I was trying to draw in the picture up here. I have a whole bunch of orientation modules and a whole bunch of sort of grid cell modules. They're both doing modular trick. That is, they are anchored differently. Um, and so if I read out the orientation modules, I get my orientation and it's unique to an environment. If I read out my grid cell modules, I get my location and it's unique to an environment. Um, and, uh, and then in this scenario, if I can make these small enough um, such that uh, I don't have uh, a, a huge amount of exhaustive learning, um, then, um, and I don't have to do a lot of repeats in here. So there's, uh, these are small maybe. Uh, you, know, it's, you know, could I get this to work? Could I, by combining unique orientation and unique grid cells and lots of them, could I get it to work in some way? You wouldn't be able to path integrate correctly until you recognize the environment. Um, which, which modules would not work? So these modules depend on this being right. Uh, knowing how, if you had, if you, if you were trying to recognize the environment, you move around, these update, the question of which direction to move the bump when you move mm -hmm. depends on these. Mm -hmm. But these depend on which environment is.